seven characteristics of a healthy church. And so we're doing, I've stopped to do a mini series in the book on live in peace. Notice verse 13. In uh, the middle of the sentence of Greek 13, there's a period in that verse. Verse 13, there's a period. And then he begins this series of 18 imperatives. He says, live in peace with one another. And that's really the catchphrase for the seven characteristics of a healthy church. And then he's going to talk about how you must live in peace. And he's going to go through live in peace. That's the first thing. And then he's going to go to the second characteristic, admonish the unruly, and then encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. So here are the seven imperatives of a healthy church. Live in peace. Admonish, admonish, that word admonish is, is the imperative. Admonish the unruly. Encourage is an imperative. The faint-hearted. Help, that's the imperative, the weak. Be patient, that's the imperative. See, that's the imperative. Seek, that's the imperative. Those are the imperatives. Those are the commands in this section. And what Paul is showing is the importance of living in peace uh, within, and one another is the congregation at Thessalonica. And he's going to talk uh, th about the importance of living live in peace with one another and some of the difficulties in doing that for man, admonish the unruly is our subject matter of today. It's two Greek words and, and they're, co they're compounded, the works, uh, so, so it takes a little bit to explain them, um, admonish the unruly. Now, it's obvious that the English translated translation is not a bad translation of unruly. Now, that makes sense to you when you put unruly, right? Because these are people who are not, that are not obeying the rules, people who don't obey the rules, unruly. Uh, everybody else is obeying the rule, and they're not. And, and so uh, the, to um, admonish the unruly. And, and of course, the, the word admonish, admonish is, is probably not a bad translation of that word either. The problem is, what do these words mean? And how do we do that? And what is our goal? Why do we admonish, why do we admonish the unruly? To live in peace with one another. Right? To live in peace. And this is going to be true with each of them. Each time we go there, why do we, why do, we do this? Why do we, why do we encourage the faint-hearted so we can live at peace with one another? Why do we help the weak so that we can live? Is it, so we can be on the same page and, and yada, yada in the, in the church. And, and so he offers us great ministry. There's a ministry to admonish the unruly. For example, there's a ministry, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everybody, seek, uh, uh, see and seek. These are all ministries within the congregation to help people uh, so that we can live in peace with one another. All right, so that's, that's where we're going with this subject matter over the next few weeks. We're going to take a look at that. Uh, to look at a good, healthy church. That's what we want to be. We want to be a good, healthy church. And, and listen, there are a lot of people with a lot of troubles in a good, healthy church. Would you agree? Look, Thessalonica was a very good, healthy church. Paul breaked down it all the time. He said, look, you guys, but look, because we have ministry to one another, all kinds of people come into the church, young, young new believers with a lot of stuff, other people are going through th struggles in their life. You know, some are unruly. And some are faint-hearted. Some are weak. Some require patience from us. Uh, some irritate us so bad that we want to hit them with a car or something. 
and you can't retaliate. Don't pay back evil with evil. Oh, see, all this goes within a church. Uh, as he goes through all this stuff, he, he says, and this is where ministry is inside the church. We know about ministry outside the church with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we understand the grace principle. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. But what about inside the church? You have all of these great ministry opportunities inside a church. And listen, the point is not to point your finger at these problems. The, these are minist, ministry opportunities for us. All right. I mean, there, he always gives us a positive word. And the point that he wants to make is live in peace. Admonish the unruly. Encourage, you see. And, and so sometimes we have to be reminded not everybody in the church is healthy. You know, not everybody in the hospital is healthy. Right? You hope the staff is. <laughs> Right? That's why you go to the hospital. Sick people go to the hospital. They hope that everybody in the hospital is uh, healthy. You know, it should probably concern us a little bit when 30 or 40 percent of the hospital staff is unwilling to get, a, get the vaccine. You go, like, wait a minute. I could go to the hospital with tonsillitis and pick up COVID from a worker in the hospital. They get that stuff. So, but you know, you don't go to the hospital because the hospital, you go to the hospital. So the point is about the church. You, you have a lot of people inside the body of Christ with a whole lot of issues. There's as much ministry in the church as there is outside the church. And that's Paul's point. And in the church, we need to fix these things as best we can fix them. Right? Need to fix them as best we can fix them. You know, he tells us what the key words are. Right? I mean, he gives us key words like encourage the faint hearted. I mean, he gives us key words of ministry opportunities. And uh, so let's have a word of prayer. And then we're going to get in this idea of live with peace by admonishing one another. Admonishing one another so that we can live in peace. Well, you know, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't, you can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. What do I do to get back into the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit called spirituality? I have to confess my sin. Could be mental attitude type of sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. Got to confess that in science because every believer is a priest in the church age. Every believer is a priest. 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. And it's your responsibility to take care of your own life business with the Lord. It's your responsibility to confess your sin. And uh, so I'm going to give you a moment to do that. According to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I give you a moment. This is priesthood business, so be sure you do it. So the Holy Spirit can teach us how to be a good, healthy church where people with problems can come to and find solutions. To be a good hospital. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. We pray today, Father, as we look at admonish the unruly, one of the, one of the, one of the great ministries in a church in order to live at, at, with peace with one another. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister uh, to us how we can do this uh, in a way that brings peace within the congregation, the healthy church. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me remind you, notice at the very top of your paper in my introduction to you, uh, two key passages on living in peace. Live with peace. Live, live with peace with one another. Live in peace with one another. In, in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 9, be sure you get this because this is how you live at peace with one another, whether it's in your marriage, in your family, in your church, in your business. 
whatever divine institution you're engaged with. Now listen to what he said. This is Romans 12, 19. If possible, so far as it depends on you. Now you ought to circle that, that as it, on you. As far as it depends on you. In other words, take care of your side of the street. Right? Take care of your side of the street. You can't take care of the other side. You take care of your side. As far as it depends on you, you be at peace with all people, with all men. All right? We can all do that, can't we? We can all do that. Be at peace with all. As far as it depends on you, your job isn't to change other people's life. It's just to change yours. You can have peace with them. As far as it depends on you. All right? As far as it depends on you. Then there's another verse that's really important, in my opinion, 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter, verse 16, where he refers to the title of the Lord. He gives you a title of the Lord, the Lord of peace. Now may the Lord of peace himself <coughs> continually grant you, this is a promise to you, continuously grant you peace. Watch this now, and you ought to circle this. In every circumstance. Well, you say to me, Ron, maybe some circumstances. He didn't say that, did he? I mean, God knows the difference between every and some. The Lord of peace himself. He is the head of the church and the savior of the body. He and he himself. Now, I'm going to assign this to somebody else. He will take care of his business. And here's his business. He will grant you. He will continuously, every day, every moment, until it gets completed, will continually grant you peace in every circumstance. And I can't tell you how many people want to leave their marriage over this. They, they leave their family over this. They leave their job over this uh, because they found a circumstance that they can't find any peace. Listen, as far as it depends on you, you can have peace, right? Well, come on now. I just read Romans 12, 19. Does it not say, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men? 12, 18. Whatever is that, whatever's on your paper there. Thank you. As far as it depends on you. Listen, as far, as far as it depends on the Lord, he will, he will grant you, continuously grant you peace on your side of the street. Is that true? <laughs> Have I had prayer? I just wondered. I'd like to see that prayer get answered right away. All right. Here's Colossians. Here's another one. This is all about living with, with peace. Here's another one, Colossians 3.15. Listen to this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let it rule. Don't let the obstacle, don't let the circumstance outside your life rule your life. You understand? Well, I'm so upset I can't sleep. Don't let that rule you. Let the peace of Christ rule your heart. See, the word let is volitional, isn't it? When you say the word let, that's volitional. Why are you not letting? Why are you not letting the peace of Christ rule your heart? See? Because let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body. And listen to what he said. Be thankful. Be thankful. You can't control the circumstance, but you can control how it affects your heart. Right? 
Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. And now he comes and said, so now you've got a situation in your life where, where somebody is attached to you, whether in the congregation or what, who is unruly, and you're to admonish them. Right? So here we are. I'm going to talk about six aspects of the how and the why of admonishing an unruly. It could be in your marriage. It could be in your family. It could be in your church. It could be in your business, right? It could be in any divine institution where the devil always is trying to set it on fire, right? Always trying to disturb. Well, we do know that, don't, it? don't we? I mean, here, and here's what he says. He says, admonish the unruly. So I'm going to look at both of these Greek words, admonish in point one. The first word, the first word, unruly. I'm going to start with that word. Notice it's got an a, the A on the front of the Greek word. Look at the Greek word. I wrote it out, A-T-A-K-T-O-S. The A on the front of that word is an alpha privative. That's the reason the word is un. UN, unruly. The A in the front of that word means unruly or without rule. Without rule. Doesn't like rules. Doesn't like rules. Okay? Is rebelling against that. The alpha privative is without. This person ha is without respect for the position of authority or the policies of authority. Man, have you raised kids? Have you raised kids? Well, see, some of them are passive unruly, and some are aggressive unruly. Right? If you got two kids, you probably got, you probably got these two kids. One is in your face, and the other is behind your back. I mean... I had four, so I had, I had a whole mess of it. Well, listen, this is just about it. The, 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 the point is, you're always going to have unruly people that in your family, in your marriage, in your church, right? They, they don't like the position of authority. They don't have a respect for it. Now, if we admonish them and God does his work, God will always do his part if we'll do ours. But listen, he is the Lord of peace, and that's what he wants. So he's always going to work his side of the street. He wants you to work your side, because you, he tells you, you got, as far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on you, you got to live with peace. Live in peace with these people. Live in peace. On your side of the street, you got to do that. But on their side of the street, you have to admonish them. All right? And the, the unruly, the alpha primitive in the English is the word U-N unruly, don't like rules, don't like regulations. You know, sometimes, like, a football player goes out, and he don't like all the rules and regulations. I don't like to go to practice. I like to play the game. I don't like to learn all my plays. I just like to go out and play and have fun. Well, do that, but don't join a team, right? And if that guy joins the team and don't want to play by it, and you're trying to organize the team, you got a mess on your hand. You got a big mess on your hand. That's true in the military. It's true wherever there's an organized business, family that wants some kind of order. Okay? And so that, that is the word unruly. Now, the T-A-K-T-O, look at the, the, other, the other word there is T-A-K-T-O-S. Now, there, here's what's important, because you have to know that that's an adjective form of tasso, T-A-S-S-O. That's a, that, just the way sometimes words are identified. That's the adjective form in the Greek language of the word tasso. Now, that's really important because tasso is a very important word. Anytime there's organized sports or military or everything where you have to work as a unit to reach a goal, which is a business, a marriage, a family, 
football or basketball or whatever it is, we're, we're military, whatever, Tasso is a really important point because it means that there is a rank, there's rank authority, there's a ranking system, you know, that, that comes down the pike. In the business, you know, you're the CEO and then goes all the way down to the laborer, you know. You got the coach and then you got the assistant coaches and then then you've got the varsity and you got all this kind of stuff. In the military, you have the same rank. Tasso is, is a, a system of divine delegated authority. And it could be several layers. It may, maybe just one and he's got, maybe a guy's got a business, he's got one employee. But the odds are if it grows, then you, you begin to get layers of it. Mental manage it, management and all of that. And we probably all in some time in our life have lived in those kind of, kind of, or worked in those kind of conditions. This is the word tassel. So the unruly is the person who doesn't like the divine delegated system of authority and divine institutions, doesn't like it. I mean, I, I was a guy who could have never made a, a career of the military because I didn't like it. I respected rank and authority, but I didn't want to make a life where everything was regulated in me. I, 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 I wasn't one of those guys that liked that people to tell me when to go to bed, when to get up, when to wash, and when to go to the toilet, and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I just wasn't one of those guys that liked it, although I had respect for authority. I was raised to have respect for authority. My people raised me to have respect for authority. In the, in, in the South, it's yes, sir, and no, ma'am, and all that business. And it, it's a good thing. To, it's, a, it's a good system to have, however you train it, a good system to know that the person authority, you need to respect. It's, it's not so much you respect the person, you respect the position. I mean, I, 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 I played under two different coaches, and I had to learn that. In the military, I had to learn that. I, I was always under authority. I, I never got up into any position where there was anybody under me. I never had the, the opportunities to go like, you just do what I tell you. I, I never had that. Because I wound up in Womack Army Hospital, and although I had rank, it didn't mean anything because we, we, I worked in surgery. And so there, there, there was no rank. I mean, I talked to the... Whoever was doing surgery, he was a doctor. I don't even know what his rank was. Rank wasn't a big issue uh, when you were in the midst of surgery. So, but we all knew they all had it. <laughs> no doubt about that. So, the tasso is an interesting word that's used here. It's used a lot with military and sports, that's for sure, like the Olympics and such as that stuff. So the unruly is a person uh, who evades, it could be from a leadership where they evade responsibility or to act irresponsible, but they don't like, uh, they don't like delegated positions of authority or policies. And when you don't, people have a tendency to point their finger against who overholds the position of authority. Well, I hate my boss. I hate this. I hate the policies. I hate all that. I know, but why do you keep working there then? Say, why why do you keep playing football or a coach like that if you don't? I mean, why are you sitting around complaining about it? So that's that's the part. So admonish is the other word. Now that's a compound word. Watch the word admonish. See the N O U. Now that that's the word N O U S. That's the, nous is the word for mind in the Greek language. This is the word mind. The T-H-E-T-E-O in the verbal form with the O on the end of that, that's an adjective form. Look what, how I explained it. That's the adjective form of tithemi, which means to put or to place or to set. It means to put or place a warning in the mind of the unruly. 
is to issue a warning, and don't we all do it? You know what a coach will say? Here's what a coach will say. Let me tell you, Adama. Are you prepared to ride the bench? Because I got somebody over on the bench to take your, your place in a heartbeat. And said, if you don't, if you don't if you don't go by the rules, if you don't do what I tell you how this game is going to run and do, you're not on your own out there. When I send a play in, I expect that play to be run the way I expect it. If you can't do it, you're going to sit on that bench. Just depends how much you want to play football and how much you respect authority. My, my, my coach had those conversations with me. You're not giving me enough out there, Edema. You can't, you can't slack on me in the third quarter. I don't care if you can manage your guy or not. If you can manage your guy, that means more, more running yards for the, for the guy in the backfield. What are you telling me? So, you know, yeah, I could send, I could huff and puff and go like with the coach. It's all about the coach. I could go home and tell my parents I'm leaving football because of the coach. The coach was telling me the absolute truth. He was telling me the absolute truth. That, are you gonna are you gonna shape up or on? Because we can't we can't win this way. I can't have a guard playing like you. You must be thinking about where you're going after the game because you're not thinking about the game. Yeah, I'll put you on the bench and you can think about it the rest of the night if you want. So here's the word, here's the word admonish, you see. Here's the word admonish. And it means to to put a warning there about it. In the, in the, in the, in the, in a moment, I'll talk about it from a military standpoint. Point number two, admonishing the unruly is a doctrinal warning to prevent divine discipline being apply, applied to correct behavior. Listen, you try to get to a, a young person or you try to get to somebody because, listen, you want to help them get ahead. I'm not trying to do that. My coach wasn't doing all this because he had added in for me. He wanted me to be a better team player. You know, just wanted me to be a better team player. You know, you're not, a, you're not the only guy playing out here. You're a team player. I want you to be a team player. And, and most of us all the time, you can't do that. You can't, you know, if you got a house full of kids... You know, you got to have some kind of order, some kind of rule. And when they don't do that, it disrupts the whole, the whole, the whole family. It dis disrupts the ball team. It disrupts the, the, the team that you're on in the military or, or, the, or your job. You know, you don't do your job. Somebody's got to do it. When you're not holding your position and doing what you're supposed to do, then the guys around you have to pick up the slack. And nobody likes doing that. You know, if you're a lineman, the other linemen don't want to have to do your job and theirs too. And military's the same way. Listen, if you don't pull your, your weight in the military, a whole bunch of people are going to get killed. That's the point. I mean, they teach you to be a man team. If somebody gets killed, you're so well organized, the next guy takes, takes his slot. And you've got to have that kind of inner discipline. Admonishing the unruly is a, is a doctrinal principle, a doctrinal warning to prevent divine discipline. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 12. We're, we're not too far from it right here in uh, Thessalonians. Let's go to 12. I want to show you some, something. We talk about it all the time. Sometimes we don't look at it. But here we are. This, this, if you have a study Bible, they opened it up in verse 4. I want to jump down to verse 5 where we have this instructions out of Proverbs he says, my son, my son, do not, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved. 
For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. And here's what he's telling you. And, and, and why is God doing that? Because he wants you to live in peace with him, and you're unruly. And so he talks about light discipline. Light discipline, that's to get your attention. That's just an attention getter. Light discipline is an attention getter. It's kind of like what the coach said. He pulls me out, and he has a light conversation with me. And if that worked, I go back out there, and I do what I'm supposed to do, and I give that coach 110%. And when the ball game's over, I go home and go to bed because I'm too tired to go on a date. And if I don't do that, then I'm in trouble with, all, I'm in trouble with my coach. So there's a light discipline. It's a warning. It's, it's done in a, in, a, in a way that makes sense to you whether you're a business guy or a military guy or an athlete or, or a member of the household, it's done in such a way because the whole idea, let's, let's live in peace. And, and so you give him a, a light conversation about it. Look, this is not going to work. And so let's, 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 and so it's a very, and so it's light. It's a light called a light discipline. And then that goes, notice in verse 5, it goes to reprove. To reprove. Now, now what the coach has done is he's benched me. Now, I don't know about all coaches, but when, when the coach I had, if you, got, if you were varsity and you got benched, you got benched for the next game. Let me tell you, he very seldom ever had to have that conversation with seniors, and he very seldom had to have that conversation with other guys on the team. You know why? Because the senior level of guys had a talk with the guys in the huddle before the coach ever, before you ever got on the sidelines. They had a talk with you. They're just trying to, look, you, you, because if you got benched by, by my coach, you got benched that coach, you, not only did you lose that game, you lost the next game, and you might have lost your position, period. That's reprove. That's reprove. For, for whom the Lord loves, he, he disciplines, and scourge, scourge in that day, was to take you right down to where you wished you were dead. You know, scourging, that tore the meat right off your bone, off to where you could see your bones. Scourging in that day, they hit you with, with stuff that would rip your flesh off your body, and they would hit you until they got down, they could see bone. That's a scourge. And listen, this is what the Lord says he'll do. I hope you understand that. And you know what he's asking you to do? Live in peace. You know, you know what he's asking you to do? He's asking you to confess your sin and get back with the program. Listen, you, can't, you cannot live for Christ and be spiritually healthy and be unruly. What we're warning people, and unruly people, we're warning them of the discipline that's coming to their life. Listen, we do it as parents. We go like, look, you've had a good life with us. We've worked hard to provide a really good life for you. You have an opportunity to get an education. You have an opportunity to make a better life for you than we've given you, and we, we have worked hard our whole life to give you advantages. And you should, you should do this. 
Because once you leave and go on your own, you're on your own. However you want to live, that's your choice. You're not going to come back and live with me that way because I'm giving you all the advantages to make it in life. The, listen, you know, this, the story of the two prodigal sons, one stayed home as a prodigal, one left as a prodigal. They were both unruly. But the one son went, look, I'll go out, go out on my own. And he said, well, go for it. He said, well, give me my inheritance now. No, I'll go out and make it. Did he? No, he squandered, his, squandered the, the father's inheritance and made a wreck of his life. And when he came to his senses, the father let him come back home to go through training again. Now he's ready to be trained. He wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't willing to be trained the first time. The family trained him. The family offered him everything, every possibility in life to do well. He chose not to. When he came back, he came back with a change, a whole different attitude. He, he had come to his senses. And what we're admonishing is to try to do that. You, you, give, them, you, give, them, you give them the easy talk. Then you give them the tough talk. And then the Lord, the Lord, listen, then the Lord gets after them. The Lord gets after them. I hope you do know that. Well, you do now. Here's Hebrews 12, 10. For, listen to how they explain it. For they, talking about parental, that divine, divine delegated authority, for they did, disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. See, that's, that's like the admonishing. But he, God, disciplines us for our good. Watch this now. Watch how God considers good in your life so that we may share his holiness. That's experiential sanctification. Did you get all that? That's a whole lot, buddy. <laughs> that was a whole lot of stuff I just gave you. Experiential sanctification. Listen, God disciplines us. He'll bring us right down to scourging us to bring us back to his holiness. Experiential sanctification. That's a pretty powerful idea, isn't it? Is it not? In a military example... The light discipline would be they will give you special, de special duty details. When I first went in the military, I was, I was not happy with the whole thing. I got drafted, and I, I was kind of an unhappy camper. <clears throat> they changed that in me. I dug potty holes. I can't tell you how many days. How many uh, times a day? Yeah, uh, like uh, f like six feet wide and four feet deep or something. There wasn't no like a little potty hole. There's a big potty hole like for the whole camp or something. But he didn't take me. I went like, this is stupid. I guess I could salute the sergeant and get, I've only got two years, but I don't want to spend my time digging potty holes. I forget what they called it. Lat latrine duty. I wasn't cleaning the toilets. I was going out in bivouac areas and digging holes. And they would come out and measure it. The sergeant would come out and measure it. And I didn't dig one a day. I dug several a day. It didn't take me long because I'm not, a, I'm not totally stupid. I could salute the rank on a person without getting personal with him. I don't care what his, if he had rank above me, I, I, I saluted him and went drove forward. It was the best thing that ever happened in my life. It was the best thing. Listen, it was the best thing. And I was a guy who had respect for authority. I just mad at everything. That didn't take long. So the military has a way. Their light discipline is to give you special duty. And if you don't respond to that, 
then they'll reduce your rank, if you have any. <laughs> they like give you three ranks, you know, just if you, if, you, if you make it by a certain number of days. But then they reduce your rank, which is reducing your pay and, and privileges. And then if you don't respond to it, they give you a dishonorable discharge. And I'm going to tell you, in my day, the last thing you wanted to do was go back home with a dishonorable discharge because everybody in my community served in the military. And they had brothers and sisters and all kinds of people who died. Second World War. When I was a kid growing up, my dad himself died. Second World War. The last thing, it was... I don't know what people think about it today. I don't know if they, they give a rip what kind of discharge they get. But you might as well kiss your future in my community goodbye if you got a dishonorable discharge. No way I hire you. It was a disgrace. I don't know what it is today. Point number three, and then we'll take a, a break. The difference between ad, admonishing and teaching, these are not the same thing. The difference between admonishing and teaching is that admonishing is identifying the things that are wrong, like attitudes and behavior, and to issue a warning by encouraging change before others have to bring discipline. That's admonishing. In Titus 3, 1, I, I put the first four verses. I'm just going to read one. When it says, remind them, that's like admonishing. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authority, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. That idea of remind them is admonish. If the believer is receptive to the warning, then we can teach them categorical Bible doctrine, the truth that pertains to the issue they're on and the bigger issue of their life. Paul in Colossians 3.16 is dealing with it. He says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another. And then he brings in the idea of praise and worship. He says, one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thanksgiving in your heart to God. Isn't that interesting? That having a sense of truth and living with peace within the congregations improves the whole atmosphere of praise and worship, even in song. What a wonderful balance that is when you have the balance between the truth of the Word of God categorically taught to your life as we are today. An example of it would be admonish the unruly. That's a categorical doctrine. So that you have thankfulness, so that you have thankfulness in your heart. Rather than just being torn up and discouraged and things of that nature. Point number four on your paper. It is the responsibility of the pastor teacher to consistently teach and admonish the unruly by teaching categorical Bible doctrine for the congregation to make self-evaluations and to make changes in their attitude and behavior for the Lord. In other words, try to, try to teach like we are today to jump ahead of it, to try to show you uh, and this applies not just to the congregation, it applies how you would operate any divine institution as a believer. 
But my job on a consistent base is to consistently teach categorical Bible doctrine out of the scriptures uh, to admonish the unruly in this case and for us to live at peace with one another. Uh, in other words, to take, I would rather us to take personal responsibility for the way we think and behave when things are going well so that we can be prepared for when things get tough, right? It just makes sense. Best way to learn it is in the classroom and not in uh, our life experiences. Uh, in Colossians 1, 28 and 29, we proclaim him, Paul writes, we proclaim him, Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. That is the practical side of the word of God. Wisdom is the practical side. The practical, you know, they call it wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, you know, that whole group. They call it the wisdom literature because if you, especially, I love Proverbs. I, I, in my opinion, everybody ought to read a proverb every, every day because it's the practical side to God's genius. And it, it's just, it's, it's, it's just, Solomon was just really good in his writing and his uniqueness. And so I just personally like Proverbs. I think Proverbs, because it is, it is the practical side of wisdom. The reason I read it every day. We proclaim, we proclaim Christ and monishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that, so that this is the purpose, so that we may present everyone mature, perfect or mature in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all of his energy, which is so powerfully working in me. And that, he's talking about the pastor teacher's role in a healthy congregation. Titus 3.10, I took for the NIV just because I think it's a little clearer to understand. He says, warn, which is the idea of admonish. Warn a divisive person, that would be an unruly one, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him or her. The idea here, when it says nothing to do with them, means to have social interactions with them. Social, don't, don't fellowship with them. And he tells you why it, here. He says, you may be sure that such a man is, is warped and sinful and is self-condemning. All right? The, the, the reason we withdraw fellowship is hopefully what you hope that he would, he misses the Christian fellowship where you pray together, you talk the scriptures together, you care about one another deeply and that concept. Now, those of us that have that, when somebody takes that away from you or, or you're on, listen, one of the things when I go off on vacation, even though I mix and mingle with other people, one thing I really miss, I really miss my congregation. I miss the fellowship of spiritual mature people. You know, when I, when I go off and, and spend time, I spend most of the time, even if they're church people, they're not mature. I mean, I very seldom find anybody that is that's spiritual mature. I mean, they just don't have enough information. They, they, there's no, quote, fellowship in, in the word or in the spirit or any of that type of thing. And... It don't take me long, and I miss that. I miss that. I really miss that. And 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 so it, it you know I, this time I was I went to Michigan. I was going to spend at least ten days or maybe a couple weeks. Four days I come home. <laughs> Four days. I said to Deanna. Deanna went up there with me, and I. I said, you know, I'm ready to go home. And she said, okay, four days. I mean, you almost go like that, ain't worth a trip, four days. But 
uh, you know, I don't have a dog. I miss my church. You know, most people say, well, I miss my dog. I had one kid with me, but I, I miss that. We, as a family, I miss our time together. I, I, miss, I miss fellowship with mature people. I want to be with people that are mature, and I, I love that fellowship. And just a short distance away from it, I go like, look, I'm, I need to go home. <laughs> I need to go home. They get a little irritated at me when I tell them I'm going home, and they say, well, you are home. And I went, no, I, I, no I'm going home. <laughs> now, this used to be my home, but it ain't no more. Point number five, spiritually advancing believers, such as I hope you are, Spiritually advancing believers, those are people who are consistently every day moving forward, not backwards. Spiritually advancing people are instructed to withdraw social contact with any of the unruly uh, believers after, after giving adequ adequate admonishing. And it's not one time, is it? He said, go a second round at least. You know, we even play four quarters in football. So yeah, you, you might, you know, but what is adequate, he told us earlier, uh, at least take a second round with them. And of course, if you live with them, you got, you got daily rounds, haven't you? Now, when we're, talking about, when we're talking about admonishing, we're not talking about nagging, right? We're not talking about nagging on the one hand, and we're not talking about bailing out on the other. As a person in authority, it's not about nagging them. You just tell them the way it is and how, how it's going to roll out on them, and you tell them a couple times, and then they don't want to listen. They don't want to listen. So on your part, don't go nagging then. Nagging, not, nagging never works. It don't work for you, and it don't work for them. On the other side, the, one, the other side, the side of the unruly, don't bail out just because it got a little, just because somebody's gotten after you. You know, the coach says, hey, to me, you don't shape up. I'm sitting on the bench. He said on the bench, I still play football. And I'd have lost a game. I knew it. If he set me down, I'd lose another game. I didn't want to do any of those. But that was my choice, wasn't it? I could have bailed. I could have went like, oh, coach. And I could have went home. And his mother said, well, why, why are you home? I said, well, coach. I could have done that. I didn't. Don't bail either. I mean, the, the admonishing is a good thing for you, even though you don't want to hear it. Somebody's got to tell you, and it should be done by somebody who does it in love and does it because they care. And it's because they've been instructed to do it. It's a ministry within the body of Christ or in the home or wherever that is, needs to be applied. So here is 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter, 6 and 7. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep aloof from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not a, according to the traditions which you receive from us. In other words, they, they heard it in church, they heard it from you, and they don't care. All right? Not according to tradition which they have received from us, for you yourself know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act as in an undisciplined manner when we were among you. We weren't unruly in our behavior in ministering to you. We don't think you should do that with others. And so there's a, there's a lot of instructions in 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15, because there's not 1,415. If any, and here's an admonishing. If anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him socially in order that he may feel ashamed. In other words, he senses a loss. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn or admonish him as a brother. You know, we're still family, is the point. Now, let me close. And I'm going to give you a, a, something to take home and read because I don't 
have the time it would take an hour to cover this. Admonishing the unruly is the responsibility of those who hold positions of divine authority. That's for sure. The person who holds divine, uh, de the delegated divine authority in a marriage has to be responsible for it. That would be the husband, parents in parenting, in family, employment, that's the, from the top down through the chain of command or military, nation, etc. You ought to read Colossians, the third chapter, 18 through 25, because it lays out divine institutional thinking with this. Parenting failure in this area has, has devastating consequences on children and family. An example, and I want you to read this. Now, it's only two chapters. Sometime this week, Eli the priest and his two sons, who he put in ministry under him. And you want to read 1 Samuel 2 and 3, because he shows you what you must not do and how bad it will turn out. Eli and his two sons, be sure to do that. In, uh, in the third chapter, verse 13, here, here's how the Lord laid it out. For I, I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. That's part of admonishing. And boy, what a terrible story. If you knew the history that resulted from this, when God said, I will judge his house forever, the story behind Eli is a story of tragedy, of parenting and ministering. Well, I want to leave that with you. It is a good read on this idea of admonishing and what happens if you don't? What are the consequences if you just let your kids run? If you, if you, never, if you never get a hold of their unruliness or in, oh, how it can affect your business or your ministry or your church or however it might be. So what we try to do is stay ahead of the curve. What we try to do is teach categorical Bible doctrine on a consistent, regular basis not out of need. We just try to do that on a consistent base, try to pay attention to where the Lord is taking us, and then let him deal with it. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed for today. We start a new series of studies on Tuesday. That's our luncheon. If you would like to attend our luncheon, just come on down from 12 to 1 o'clock here at the church. Uh, we'll feed you a lunch and give you a Bible study. We'll be in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, uh, where he talks about the resurrection and the resurrection body. And so we're going to do a, a, a pretty good study on 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. Uh, a lot of people... They, 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 they believe there's going to be a resurrection, but that's about all they know about it. But Paul really deals with it, uh, and he deals with it uh, in regard to the judgment seat of Christ and everything in these first 10 verses. So we're going to do a short, short series um, uh, during this month of August. On Tuesday, 12 to 1, Father, we're so thankful for your love, mercy, and grace. Thank you for a great congregation, Father, of people who are spiritually advancing. They have great ministries, not only in the church, but outside the church to the community and even to communities around the world. We pray, Father, for our foreign missionaries out there on the front field. I mean, it is really difficult times. I want to thank you, Father, for uh, David Widgeon's uh, and Angie's church. Uh, they had guys, they had teams overseas that got caught on a 
uh, resurgence of uh, the COVID. And we've got them all back but one. And uh, we pray for that one. Uh, but it has really, it has really affected foreign missions. It, it's affected ours here, uh, how we can get out there. And we need to be very sen sensitive about their, their financial needs and, and being able to get them in the, these nations like South America and the Philippines and, and uh, places like this, uh, vaccine. They're in desperate need of vaccine, Father. And uh, I pray that that would get to their areas and uh, meet their needs in Jesus' name. Amen.